Hello, and welcome into the Star Wars Legends Lounge, the show that celebrates the books from Star Wars Legends. I'm Aaron Motes. I hope everyone that celebrates Thanksgiving had a festive holiday. I know I did. We had 11 people at my house. Just some fun, family, and a lot of food. The day started out with an early morning turkey trot, 5K. We ate dinner in the early afternoon, and then we played cards and napped in front of the TV. But it wasn't all great for me, because after the turkey trot run, your illustrious host here dropped his phone and broke the screen. And then I had to brave the traffic and crowds on Black Friday to go out and get a new one. But enough about my Thanksgiving hijinks. You all want to hear about today's book, Deceived by Paul S. Kemp, the second in the Old Republic series of legend stories. And I'll get to that in just a few minutes. But first, it's listener question time. Today's email comes from Jacob, who says, Hello, my name is Jacob, and I love your show. I've listened to all the episodes. I've been a Star Wars fan since I was young and watched the original trilogy on VHS. My favorite movie is Empire Strikes Back. I also love the prequels and have mixed feelings about the sequels. But I've loved all the other new side movies and television shows. I'm just beginning my reading of Legends and have read Darth Plagueis and Maul Shadowhunter. I want to read Lockdown or Cloak of Deception next. I loved Shadowhunter. It was a fast-paced, fun book that I finished in just about five hours. Wow, that's some fast reading there, Jacob. Jacob continues, Darth Maul has become one of my favorite characters over the years. My questions for you are about Shadowhunter and Darth Maul. Have you read it? What do you think of Darth Maul's story and progression? Are there more Darth Maul books or comics or stories that he's in? Do you think we'll ever see Darth Maul in live action again? And when you do your review of Shadowhunter, I'd love to give a written review on my opinion as well. Well, thank you very much for the email, Jacob, and welcome to the wild, wonderful, weird, and occasionally nonsensical world of legends. I'm glad you're enjoying your journey so far. I have read Shadowhunter once, but that was 20 years ago, back in late 2001 or early 2002, and I didn't really remember much about it. So I hopped onto Wikipedia and read a synopsis of the story to kind of refresh my brain. Some of it sounds familiar, but I'd be lying to you if I told you I remembered most of it. Most of the things I recognized were actually connections to the MedStar duology and the Coruscant Knights trilogy of books that I have read much more recently. I like Darth Maul's story, Jacob. I like the Maul stuff in canon a little more than in Legends. But, of course, the authors in Legends couldn't really do much with Maul because George Lucas didn't decide to bring him back until three or four years into the Clone Wars animated show. I like Maul's story as one of a person who is an agent of revenge and chaos. Maul is best when he isn't really working for the dark side or the light side. Maul is best when he is just trying to wreak havoc on those that he perceives to have wronged him. Now, Jacob, there are a handful of other Darth Maul books and comics, but not really as many as you'd think. In Legends, you have a young reader book called Shadow Conspiracy and two comic runs, the Darth Maul comic from the year 2000 and Death Sentence in 2012. In canon, there's the comic Son of Dathomir, which was in 2014, and the Darth Maul comic run in 2017. Lastly, do I think we'll ever see Darth Maul again in live action? I would say 90% sure that's a no, 10% yes. I don't think I'd ever say never. I think it would be much more likely to see Maul again in an animated show or a video game 
or in future books or comics. As to when I'm doing Darth Maul Shadow Hunter for the Star Wars Legends Lounge, it's not on my schedule for 2023, but sure, Jacob, whenever I talk about it, feel free to email in a review. That's cool. I'll read it on the air. Once again, thank you very much for the email, Jacob. And listener, if you would like to contact the show, you can email me at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or send a tweet at Legends Lounge 1. I love hearing from all of you. Now it's time for today's book, Deceived by Paul S. Kemp. Grab yourself a drink and let's head in to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. The story begins 300 years after the events of the Revan novel. The Sith invasion of the Republic has come to pass. The war has taken a toll on both sides. It's exhausted the galaxy, and it's time for peace talks. The Jedi and Republic representatives meet on Alderaan with the Sith Emperor's delegation. But the peace talks are a distraction, as the Sith lay assault to Coruscant. Darth Malgus leads the attack on the Jedi Temple. Malgus and his troops meet stiff resistance by the Jedi and Padawans led by Master Ven Zalo. Malgus and the Sith apprentices storm the temple, slicing through the Jedi resistance. Malgus marches through the temple, hunting Zalo, and he soon finds the Jedi Master. The two clash, Zalo exuding calm, discipline, drawing on the light side of the Force. Malgus, a kettle of boiling rage, drawing power from the dark side. Malgus blasts Zalo with a force push that sends the Jedi Master careening into a wall, but Zalo cushions the blow with the force, surprising Malgus with a quick counterattack. Their sabers clash, a dance of light and death. Malgus faints, catching Zalo off balance. He spins and drives his saber through the Jedi's abdomen. As Zalo falls to the floor, Malgus looks down in contempt and tells the dying Jedi, It's all going to burn. With the Jedi defeated, Malgus calls in an airstrike and destroys the temple, turning it to rubble. He calls for Darth Ongrel, the commander of Sith forces, to clear the start of the full-scale invasion. But the message is intercepted by Lord Adras. Adras says that the Sith Emperor has ordered Darth Ongrel to hold position. Now that the Sith have laid siege to Coruscant, they are in position to leverage much better terms from the Republic at the Peace Accords on Alderaan. The news disgusts Malgus, who believes the Emperor is making a mistake. On Alderaan, the Jedi sense the destruction of the Temple and the death of Master Zalo. None more so than Jedi Knight Aaron Lanier, Zalo's former Padawan. Immediately, Aaron moves to attack the Sith, but she's stopped by the Jedi and Republic representatives. They know what has happened back on Coruscant. They tell Aaron that Master Zalo would want the peace talks to continue to bring an end to the war. Reluctantly, Aaron stands down, but she vows to discover who killed her former master and take her revenge. Elsewhere, smuggler Zirid Kor is running weapons and spice for the criminal organization known as The Exchange. Zirid is a former Republic soldier and pilot who left the service following a speeder accident that killed his wife and left his daughter, Ara, without legs. Zirid is desperate to make enough credits to provide a better life for Ara and his sister-in-law. He also hopes to buy Ara a hover chair and prosthetic legs one day. Zirid's latest delivery brings him to Ord Mantell. He's ambushed at the delivery point by a group of pirates, but he escapes by triggering the explosives he was dropping off. Following the disastrous mission, the exchange orders Zirid to deliver a shipment of Eng Spice to Coruscant. Zirid refuses, saying that with the Sith fleet in orbit over the planet, 
it would be a suicide mission. But the exchange doesn't give him a choice. To pay for the loss of the weapons, Zerid either delivers the ink spice or the exchange will kill him. To sweeten a deal, the exchange says that if Zerid can deliver the ink spice, they'll cancel his debts and allow him to leave. Zerid agrees to the mission, but first he travels to the planet Volta to see his daughter in case he doesn't survive this smuggling run. Aaron Lanier also travels to Volta in hopes to find Zerid, the former shock trooper she served with at the Battle of Balmora. Knowing that Zerid is an ace pilot, Aaron hopes he can fly her to Coruscant. Zerid is surprised to see the Jedi. He's shocked to hear about the news of Master Zalu's death. But he can't believe Aaron's promise to hunt down his murderer. Zerid refuses to take Aaron to Coruscant. The two argue, but Aaron finally convinces him, saying that if Zerid needs to smuggle the Eng Spice to Coruscant anyway, it might help to have someone along with the skills of a Jedi Knight. On the way to Zerid's ship, the two are ambushed by a group of mercenaries working for the Huts. The group is led by a man named Vrath Zizor. The Huts want to stop the delivery of the Eng Spice, loosening the hold the exchange has on the spice trade to Coruscant. Zerid and Aaron escape capture, but Vrath beats the two to Coruscant. The Hut agent hails the Sith blockade and is brought onto Darth Malgus's ship. Initially, Malgus isn't interested in the fight between the crime syndicates, but Vrath tells the Sith that there's a Jedi on the smuggler ship, piquing Malgus's interests. When Zerid's ship drops out of hyperspace, it's attacked by the Sith fleet. Zerid evades the fighters and turbo lasers, diving toward the planet, but he can't dodge all of them. Zerid's ship takes several hits and loses power. As it falls through the atmosphere, Aaron ignites her lightsaber and blows out the cockpit window. She grabs Zerid and leaps through the opening just as the ship explodes. The two fall toward the surface, quickly reaching terminal velocity. Just before they hit, Aaron uses the force to push against the ground, slowing their descent just enough. They hit hard, but escape major injury. Malgus and Vrath watch as the smuggler ship explodes. Vrath is pleased that the Serpent of Engspice has been destroyed, but Darth Malgus can feel through the force that the Jedi Knight has survived, and she's now reached the surface. Zerid begins to panic. The Eng Spice is gone. That puts his life and his family in danger. He tells Aaron that he needs to get back to Volta quickly and get his family into hiding. Aaron agrees to help him, but first, Zerid must help her reach the Jedi Temple. Aaron says the Jedi Temple reaches several levels below ground. There's a chance that the aerial bombardment didn't reach far enough below the surface to destroy everything. The two travel to one of Coruscant's industrial districts, a place containing a hidden entrance to the lower levels of the temple. They sneak into the temple's surveillance room and find T-7, Master Zalo's astromech droid. T-7 shows Aaron and Zerid a recording of the Sith assault. They watch in silence as Darth Malgus makes his way through the battle toward Master Zalo. Enraged, Aaron watches as Malgus stabs the Jedi with his lightsaber, killing her master. After watching the hollow recording, Aaron sets off to kill Darth Malgus. Zerid tries to talk her out of it, but the Jedi refuses. She waits for Malgus at the temple and confronts the Sith when he arrives. They begin to fight, but Zerid intercedes and whisks Aaron away in a stolen landspeeder. At first, Aaron is angry at Zerid, but decides it's not enough just to kill Malgus. She wants to hurt him and targets the Sith Lord's Twi'lek lover. Zerid is shocked with Aaron, disgusted at what the Jedi is saying. He refuses to help her, and the two go their separate ways. Zerid to steal a ship and return to Volta. Aaron to kill Malgus's lover. At the spaceport, Zerid finds a ship, a small but fast ship. 
He steals it and makes for space. When he leaves the atmosphere, Zerid comes face to face with Wrath. The dropship belongs to the mercenary. The two clash, brawling in the cramped corridors of the ship. But Zerid has the advantage of size and strength. He knocks Wrath out and ties him up. Wrath awakens during the trip through hyperspace. The mercenary threatens Zerid, telling the smuggler his family will never be safe as long as Wrath lives. Reluctantly, Zerid agrees. He drags Wrath to the airlock and jettisons the mercenary into space. At the spaceport on Coruscant, Aaron finds the Twi'lek and captures her. She plans to kill the Twi'lek, stopping when she realizes that killing her would dishonor the memory of Master Zalo. Soon, Malgus arrives and attacks Aaron, but stands down when she tells the Sith that she could have killed his lover, but didn't. Malgus allows Aaron to leave, then turns and kills the Twi'lek. Seeing her as a weakness, he can no longer afford to have. On Alderaan, the Republic and the Sith Empire sign a peace treaty. As part of the agreement, the Republic gives up several star systems in the Outer Rim territories, while the Sith give back Coruscant. The treaty enrages Darth Malgus, who believes the Emperor has betrayed the Sith. He vows to destroy the Emperor and take over the Sith Empire himself, believing the Sith can only reach true power in the dark side through war and conflict. The story ends on Dantooine. Zerid was able to gather his daughter on Volta and flee, using the money the exchange had advanced him to go into hiding and to buy a small farm. Eventually, Aaron Lanier finds him. She tells Zerid that she's left the Jedi Order and plans to join his family. Time for a break. When we come back, I'll talk more about Deceived, the second book in the Old Republic series. I'm Aaron Motes. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. Thanks for listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge, where we celebrate the books from Star Wars Legends. But allow me to suggest a book from Star Wars canon. Queen's Peril is the story of young Padme Amidala in the first few weeks after she's elected Queen of Naboo. Joined by a group of young women with extraordinary skills, Padme and her handmaidens learn how to govern while the threat of the Trade Federation looms over the planet. That's Queen's Peril by E.K. Johnston. Welcome back to the Star Wars Legends Lounge, the show that celebrates the books from Star Wars Legends. I'm Aaron Motes, and today's book is Deceived by Paul S. Kemp. I preferred Deceived to Revan. I know that probably makes me persona non grata to a lot of you Revan fans and Old Republic fans out there. It's not that I like the characters any more than Revan. It's just that being someone who doesn't play video games does not have the intimate knowledge of Knights of the Old Republic and Darth Revan that a lot of you do. I just thought the story of Deceived works better than the Revan novel does. It's still not one of my favorites, mostly because this picks up at a point in time where the Sith invasion has already happened. In the Revan novel, we hear about how the Emperor is preparing the Sith Empire. It'll be the first time they've tried to invade since the Great Hyperspace War, centuries before. Now, over 300 years later, that invasion has come to pass. The Sith have left the Unknown Territories and have gained grounds through Republic space, getting all the way to the Core Worlds and laying siege to Coruscant. Darth Malgus leads the vanguard, attacking the surface, starting with the Jedi Temple. Darth Angrel controls all the forces 
but he stays with the Sith fleet in orbit, directing battle. And Malgus does what he sets out to do. He destroys the Jedi Temple and kills all the Jedi that were in there at the time. But what Darth Malgus isn't privy to is the Emperor's plan to broker a treaty with the Republic, ending the war and allowing both sides to portion out the galaxy, the armistice enrages Malgus. He believes it's the Sith's right to conquer the galaxy. And from what we've read in other legend stories regarding the Sith, the true Dark Lords believe the way Malgus does. It's what leads Bane to destroy the other Sith, and enact the rule of two. The Sith need chaos in order to become strong. An armistice brings peace to the galaxy. The Sith Order's power is not going to grow when stability reigns in the galaxy. Malgus knows this. Malgus believes the Emperor has lost his way. Remember, back in the Revan novel, we're told that the Emperor is already over a thousand years old. This is over 300 years after that. Perhaps the Emperor is getting a little senile in his old age. Perhaps the Emperor just doesn't want to fight anymore. But what's certain to Malgus is, if the Sith do not press their advantage, take complete control of Coruscant, and the more quote-unquote important planets in the core and mid-rim, then they'll grow complacent. And in that complacency, they will not achieve the heights that Darth Malgus believes they can achieve through the dark side of the Force. On the other side, you have the story of Aaron Lanier, a Jedi Knight bent on revenge. We, of course, know that revenge is not a motivation that a Jedi should have. It's fine for Aaron to want to bring Darth Malgus and the other Sith to justice to arrest them or if she needs to kill them, but only as a last resort to protect the remaining citizens of the galaxy. A Jedi should not want to kill someone because they have done something wrong to them. At least that's how we're taught a Jedi's motivations should be. I like this part of the story because much like Anakin Skywalker, it shows how a Jedi can become a prisoner of their emotions, of not thinking clearly. It's not until toward the end of the story, after Aaron is about to kill Malgus' lover, that she finally calms herself and opens herself up to the Force in a way that shows her an image of Master Zalo and the disappointment that Zalo has with the direction that Aaron is going. He would not want this. He would want Aaron to protect the citizens of the galaxy from the Sith, to protect them from Malgus. If that means she has to end Malgus's life, so be it. But do it from a position of justice and defense, but not because she's distraught and hurting over her master's death. Every time we see a Jedi fall, in legends, in canon, it's because they haven't taken the time to simply calm themselves and think about what they're doing. The biggest example of this, of course, is Anakin Skywalker, who is very impetuous, who lets his emotions control himself. There's nothing that says a Jedi can't have emotions, but... The Jedi cannot allow 
their emotions to get the better of them. Because if they do, because of this power that they wield, other beings suffer. Because Aaron Lanier is distraught over the death of her former master, the Twi'lek that she captures is going to suffer. That is not the Jedi way. Luckily, in the end, she realizes her folly and stops herself. Now, unfortunately for the Twi'lek, Darth Malgus himself kills her. I like the fact that this book delves into themes that aren't really addressed that often in the early part of Legends. The stories up to the end of the 90s. The stories up until basically the prequel trilogy is released. Mostly after Attack of the Clones in 2002. Early Legends, one of the best things about them in my opinion, are... They do have that feeling of Adventure of the Week, that Flash Gordon serial that George Lucas loved growing up, that you really got a feeling of watching A New Hope. That is an adventure. That is probably the most pulpy adventure Star Wars movie to date. And that's one of the things I love about early legends is the pulpy adventure of the week. However... I do like when stories get a little deeper. I do think the stories in later Legends as a whole get a little deeper with the themes that they discuss. Not to say there isn't some of that in early Legends. There are. But I think they're more prevalent in the later Legends stories, the ones published after the year 2000. And that's the thing I like most about this book. What happens to a Jedi when they become blinded by their emotions? Can they stop themselves? Can they center themselves in the Force and turn away from the dark side? Aaron Lanier almost falls, but she is able to turn away and remain an agent of the light side of the Force. In the end, she decides to leave the Jedi Order, but that's not the same as falling to the dark side to me. She's similar in Darth Malgus in believing that the two sides can't live with an armistice. It's going to eventually crumble and lead to war, and she can't be a part of that, so she decides to leave. Still, in my opinion... She remains an agent of the light side of the force. And in that, in rejecting the dark side, in remaining calm, and actually in leaving the Jedi Order because she cannot tolerate the political decisions that have been made, she is remaining the essence of what a Jedi is. So we're getting close to the end of the show, but before we go, I have a few more messages I wanted to read. First, I have a Star Wars Thanksgiving dinner by a YouTube creator named The Lego Ginger Productions, whose Thanksgiving guests are Din Djarin, who made the turkey, Count Dooku is bringing the mashed potatoes and stuffing, The Bad Batch is bringing dessert, while the Max Rebo Band is providing live music. That's an excellent list, but personally, I'd want a few more sides for my Thanksgiving dinner. Who's making the sweet potatoes or the green bean casserole? The dinner rolls, the cranberry sauce? That's a Thanksgiving dinner to me, but this is fine. Maybe this is just a smaller Thanksgiving feast than I'm used to. Thank you very much for the email, the Lego Ginger Productions. Look him up on YouTube. Finally, I wanted to end today's show with a different kind of email from listener Chris, who just recently discovered the Star Wars Legends Lounge. Chris says he was listening to my episode on The Last Command, the final installment of the original Thrawn trilogy that I recorded earlier this year. 
I said that one plot point that's never worked for me is Sabaoth using Luke's severed hand from Bespin to create the clone Luke and giving the clone the infamous Skywalker blade. They fell down that shaft at Bespin. I just don't think the Empire would have ever found them. It also doesn't work for me in The Force Awakens that someone finds the lightsaber and somehow it ends up at Maz Kanata's. I know there's a comic that explains that. I haven't read the comic. Maybe when I read it, it will work for me. But at this point in time, it doesn't. And for the most part, I like that film. Chris disagrees with my opinion. And he wrote in a very nice email why it works for him. And I wanted to read it to everyone. Chris says, quote, We know that the Imperials didn't just leave Cloud City after the heroes escaped. So, it is reasonable to assume that someone found the hand and lightsaber and sent them up the chain until Palpatine found out and had them stored for some later use at Wayland. He possibly wanted to do exactly what Sabaoth did to replace Vader. As is made clear in Return of the Jedi and later in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, Palpatine was not sure about Vader being a suitable replacement and was constantly looking to replace Vader. Perhaps he even thought he could transfer his essence into a clone of Luke without much difficulty, or it was a backup in case Vader died and Luke refused to turn to the dark side. There are a lot of reasons I can think of for Palpatine to keep the two items in question, either for a future plan or just to stroke his own ego. The biggest issue I had as a kid watching The Empire Strikes Back was I always thought the hand and lightsaber fell to Bespin, just as Luke nearly did. But if they didn't, and they stayed in Cloud City, it makes sense to me that they would have been found sooner or later. Assuming they didn't fall all the way into the planet, it makes sense to me that they would turn up again. Anyone finding a severed hand and a lightsaber would definitely take note during that time period, in both Legends and Canon. Thank you very much for the message, Chris. I really enjoyed our little email conversation back and forth, and I very much appreciate your opinion. Now, listener, if you disagree with something you hear on this show, if my opinion just doesn't sit right with you, feel free to send me an email. I'll read it on the show and let everyone hear the other side. I enjoy respectful debate. Now it's time to wrap up. If you have a question or comment for the show, you can email me at swlegendslounge at gmail.com or send a tweet at legendslounge1. Or if you want to get your voice on the show, record your own audio file and email it in. Just record it in MP3 or MP4 format. And keep sending me your favorite Star Wars character groupings. The festive season is almost upon us. Who are you inviting to your holiday parties? Can you imagine the Bad Batch and Wraith Squadron at the same party? It would be amazing. I give it six minutes until a fight breaks out. Anyway, coming up in two weeks, it's the third Old Republic novel, Fatal Alliance by Sean Williams. Once again, thank you so much for listening to the Star Wars Legends Lounge. I'm Aaron Motes. May the Force be with you. And remember, there's always a bit of truth in Legends.